live in a small world where people grow apart, yet their destinies meet. Gotuku Emanuela and Agnes Olai are practical examples of that reality. Let's start with Agnes. Agnes Olai hailed from Portacourt, Nigeria. With a background full of faith and hope, she skated through a primary education and graduated from high school in 2009. In 2010, she participated in the entrance exam to River State College of Earth Science and Technology. She got admitted to the school to study medical lab science, a three-year course. Agnes started working at a local government area in 2013. In 2014, she sat for the Joint Admission Matriculation Board, JAMP exam, aiming to study medical laboratory science with a focus in hematology, the branch of science that studies blood. She was offered microbiology that year and also in 2014. However, she declined the offers. With a goal to study abroad, she prayed to God for help. In 2016, she applied for the Sri Lanka government presidential scholarship. When the award was not in her favor in 2016, she reapplied in 2017. This time around, her joy became full when she was one of the two Nigerians awarded. The other awarded Nigeria was Ogochuku Emanuela. Ella was born in Anambra State, although she grew up in Kaduna State. There, she attended Christ Anglican Church School, a major school from nursery to secondary level. She was on scholarships right from her earliest days in school. After graduating from secondary school in 2014, she sat for jam and got admitted to UNISIC Anambra to study physics. She declined the admission offer because physics was never her dream. Though with intentions to study abroad, Ella used available opportunities before that happened. In the meantime, she accepted an admission offer to do a national diploma at the Federal College of Forestry Mechanization, Africa, Kaduna, where she studied agricultural technology. Unlike physics, agriculture was a longtime friend of Ella. In pursuit of a fusion to study abroad, Ella applied for the prestigious Japanese MEX scholarship in 2014. The same year, she commenced a national diploma in Nigeria. Although she was not awarded, she was not at a loss. The two-year program allowed her to develop her leadership skills. She became a notable leader in her school. Her leadership roles made her to oversee other states, apart from Kaduna. In addition, she was an active member of the debate club in her school. Winners never quit. Ella did not give up on her dream to study abroad. In 2016, she applied for the Sri Lanka scholarship. And like Agnes, she became a winner after another attempt in 2017. As I speak, both are in their final year as international students at the University of Peradeniya, the best university in Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome my guests, Ogotuku, Emanuela, and Agnes Ola. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for staying tuned and uh, and okay. So thank you for staying tuned and good evening to you, Sister Ella and uh, Agnes. How are you today? Oh, your mic is muted, please. Will you unmute your mic? Okay. Sorry about that. Good evening to you. Yeah, good evening. I hope you're doing uh, well. Uh, uh, yes, I'm doing well. Thank you for, for taking your time to, to honor this invitation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry for taking your sleep. It's all right. It's uh, one of the best things we do to give back. <laughs> okay, so I I follow I follow you for some time, and I I really love the way you 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 remember Nigeria, despite the fact that you have been home uh, away from home for several years now. You still continue to motivate and help people. I believe that is a good sign of a good leadership. So thank you very much for for sensitizing people on how to study abroad. 
anytime really it's uh, I believe it's important you know when um, one of us gets an opportunity it's actually a responsibility to do unwritten to pass the button and yeah like hold hold up the lamp and uh, you know get people to see the light okay uh, so Agnes how are you I'm good okay good Very to have good. you here too thank you so much yeah okay so I reading about your story and I believe the, the, the video has captured some of your details but I'm still curious about some part of the story that uh, I believe our audience are going to need at this time. Like you, you apply for the Sri Lanka scholarship and in 2016, and you had to apply again in 2017. So I'm curious about what was it that you did differently in 2017 that gave you the opportunity to win the scholarship. Well, I think there is nothing different. Maybe uh, two seventeen was the like the divine year I was supposed to get the scholarship. So the same application, but I don't know. Maybe two seventeen was a different year for me. Yeah. Okay. Very well, Hila. Uh, how is it? Uh, well. I, I wouldn't keep the car to the bag. To be honest, uh, we were supposed to get the scholarship in 2016, but you know, um, unfortunately, we are Nigerians and uh, some <laughs> unpleasant things are associated with us being Nigerians, right? Um, we were sabotaged, yeah. We were sabotaged in 2016. And we actually found out about that after we came to Sri Lanka. I'm really sorry to say about that, uh, but then sometimes we are our own enemies. We Nigerians are our own enemies. Because in 2016, when we, actually a bunch of us, applied in 2016 and of course everyone was pretty good you know with the documentation and all the process so they decided to do it like based on on first come first serve basis and if you go by that both um in the online application and the the hard copy application everything we were, you know, supposed to be those that uh, to be picked. That's why I told you, if you remember, that all hopes were high, like extremely high. That yes, we will get it in 2016. All right. Yes. yes. But uh, the High Commission of Nigeria in Sri Lanka was supposed to do some um, final, like confirmation or something with the Ministry of Higher Education in Sri Lanka. And then what did these guys do? They, of course, got the list of the applicants from Nigeria. And then, uh, yeah, tribalism set in. Mm. You know, <clears throat> didn't exactly uh, want to confirm Southern names. So, yeah, that's, wow. that's actually wow. the reason why we didn't get the 2016 scholarship. As funny as it may sound, that's the reason. And we got to know after we came here and uh, we had you know, all the hanky-panky and all the things that went on under the table. We had that from the um, the Sri Lankans themselves. Of course, they were not exactly aware because uh, they do not know who is who in Nigeria or if there are different states or different tribes or whatever. They didn't, uh, at the time, they were not aware and when they were actually telling us this they were saying it innocent they also deal but then yeah that happens and that's actually to tell people that yes when you apply for scholarships certain things could go wrong 
um, you can apply for scholarship very many times and you will not get it. It's not always because you're not good enough. Sometimes you are good enough and then, yeah, sometimes God allows some things to go on because, honestly speaking, even for the our own High Commission, Nigerian High Commission here wanted to sabotage us. I believe that God wanted us to get it at the time. It would have worked out. But then I just guess uh, they just have to do that somehow. So even if you apply for scholarship and you don't get it, you really shouldn't get frustrated. You shouldn't think that maybe it's because you're not good enough. Because sometimes you're actually good enough, you know. But then you just gotta keep trying again and again. Okay. Wow. That 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 that's really that's surprising. That's surprising. Because, uh, happens. I was, thinking, uh, I, I was thinking of what actually went wrong, but. I can see that there are a lot of politically, uh, politicking and scholarship related stuff. Yeah. But uh, the, the best we always be feel. But the first year when you, you know, you are not considered, uh, you are not awarded, so to say. And then the second year, why didn't you change? The, the application as in why didn't you apply somewhere else? Why why are you so particular about Sri Lanka? Well oh, that's a very interesting question. Agnes, you want to go for it? Well uh, I wasn't like so particular about Sri Lanka but the thing is that uh, that was the country I picked I applied for the first time and Okay. I still have the hope that the second time I'll get the scholarship. So I wasn't focused about any other country, so just Sri Lanka. Okay. Yeah. So, so my focus so was just yeah. Sri Lanka. Uh, okay. I didn't put any other country apart from this country. Yeah. You know why I ask that question is because there is an ideal, uh, there is an ideology among scholarship uh, seekers that you you spread your net all across different countries, different areas, just in case anyone walks out. But yeah, I see you both uh, are on a particular country that this they want to go, and you are able to achieve that. So I think that's a that's a. That's a word of encouragement for somebody. If you want to go to US, you can go to US. If you want to go to Sri Lanka like Ella, you can you can go there. Okay, so uh I believe that we have our uh Ella, I believe there is a slide you want to is there something else you want to tell us before we go into that? Is there anything else to ask before we go on to the um the presentation section okay uh, so now i think there's no there's no question for now. after the after the presentation people will people will ask questions okay okay cool yeah um all right so uh yes i do have a few slides um for the first five or six uh agnes will just uh say a few things on the first five or six slides and uh yeah take it from there Um, I believe you can um, see this, right? Yes, 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 great. Right, okay. 
So the first thing that always comes to our mind when assessing or applying for scholarship is why do I seek scholarship abroad? Even when I know that my country, I can actually get a good education maybe from private sectors or any state university. But why do I seek? Why seek a scholarship abroad? Before uh, one thinks of that, there are so many things you would like to achieve in life. It's not like you can't achieve that in Nigeria, but there are certain goals you've set apart for yourself to achieve. And one of the reasons why we seek this scholarship abroad is to have, uh, I wouldn't say Nigeria doesn't have a standard education, but to have uh, a quality and standard uh, education without the why do I uh, choose this part? Like, if you look at what is happening around Nigeria education, many of the states and federal universities are on strike. Like, it's still on, and we don't know when that is going to be off. That is one of the reasons why we seek scholarship abroad. And another reason is to have a very good mindset. Our system, like Nigerian system, is like corrupt, whereby some universities we tend to like mm, bribe, I say bribe, we sort. But if you're in abroad, it's what you have, like, what you know is how they assess you in abroad. You don't have to like be in a good relationship or maybe have anything to do with the lecturer before you get your your grades or whatever. Uh, another thing is like uh you have the like part to migrate and have a permanent residence with your family looking at the circumstances surrounding us sometimes it tends to like i don't want to be in nigeria i want to give have a good life and live in an environment where things are different so due to that we Six scholarship abroad. If we want to go on and on about how we take scholarship abroad, this I mean the list is endless. I mean, apart from the general ones, there are also very personal reasons why one would want to um, leave Nigeria and uh, go abroad. I'm sure that everyone here has a lot of reasons. Who is qualified for a scholarship? This is a very big question. Not everyone qualified for a scholarship. Scholarship is something that is very competitive. It's not what you just wake up and say, I want to get a scholarship and you apply without a good uh, good background of maybe your education or whatever and the one you will get it as maybe as a fresher from high school you want to get a scholarship there are some things that you need in order for you to be qualified what are those things one, you need to be good in what you are doing. If you, if the scholarship needs an essay, 
that you need to write. There are people across the world that are good in that. You cannot just pick pen and say, okay, I will write a few things and few words and I'll get a scholarship. No, it's kind of competitive. Everybody wants a scholarship. It's not just me. There are people all over that need scholarship. So if you want to be qualified for this, you are expected to have those standards, like your papers as an old student, you are expected to have good grades. You cannot have a, maybe a C and D, then you expect to get the scholarship. You have someone as A or B in all the subject, and you apply it because you feel you can get it, or you feel it's something like, let me just try with four grades and see if I can get it. It doesn't work that way. For you to be able to uh, be qualified for a scholarship, you must have good grades in either your O level or A level. There are countries that require A level for you to get a scholarship. You must have that and you must be ready. If you are going for a scholarship, you must be ready to face anything like maybe you apply over and over again for you to get that. Do I have to write IELT all these exams? It depends on the country. Like, I will use ourselves. The way we came to Sri Lanka, Nigeria is a country that speaks English and we are taught in English from our kindergarten to high school. Basically, English is not like a country that uses their language. So it depends on the country you are applying to. If the country requires you to write the exam, then you have to write. But if they don't, you have to like provide an English, something like English certificate from your school that you be taught in English, you know English, and that will pass. But if it is a country that is a must, then you have to write the exam in order for you to get it, to get the scholarship, because this is one of the requirements for scholarship. What types of scholarship are available for me? Well, there are different kinds of scholarship available, depending on what you want. We have the fully funded scholarship, the partial scholarship, third party grant, and various assistantship. Where do I start to look for scholarship? Well, you can just sit down in your mother's or your father's house and without the internet around you, without using the internet. The world is like a, an internet world. So where do I start? You start from looking at the internet. You can see uh, various sources there where whatever it is was first, you have to look from the internet. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much for that uh, intro. Um, so, moving forward, we'll just, uh, like, go on and see some other ways that we can get scholarships, apply for scholarships, and, yeah, probably everything in between, and also we'll get questions. Okay, so... Um, you want or you're seeking for a scholarship how exactly would you go about it? what are the first things that you need now if i'm being honest 
um, I would say that I'm expecting that everybody here has a passport. A passport or, or like you would prefer an international passport, although the correct term is passport. Yeah. Okay. The correct term is a passport. That's why I, I intentionally did not put international there. So you need your passport. It's a very um, important travel document. And for some ships, you actually need your passport number, even in the application form. For some, you don't necessarily need it, so um, you can start the application process uh, while also processing your passport. And so that's like a common thing for both undergraduates and postgraduate scholarship. And furthermore, for undergraduate scholarships, um, of course, you need your results from the, your secondary school results, basically your O level results. Now, some pe people that exams is not exactly recognized, but then I know some scholarships that are recognized. And um, WIAC, of course, the normal WIAC you write in school after SS3, and even the GCE WIAC, both they are all West African, senior secondary school certificate exam. So they are both the same thing. And then your secondary school transcript, which is just uh, a compilation of your results. You can, of course, get that from your school at any time. You need that. And recommendation letters. So there's one thing that uh, is, it seems minute, but it's very important in scholarships. Your recommendation later, both at undergraduate level and postgraduate. When I say postgraduate, I mean both masters and even PhD. Recommendation letters from your referees are very, very important. Right? You need them. So that's why, as a secondary school student, you like you 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 need to have. A pretty good relationship with at least uh, a teacher, maybe a principal, or you know, at least two people. There, there, uh, have to be people that are related to you academically. Yeah, people that have an academic relationship with you, not a relative. Okay, and then for the postgraduates, you can have two or three people normally relation as it's normally a minimum of two and a maximum of three so you actually need two people two academic referees at postgraduate level and one non-academic when uh, three is needed okay and this is very important as a matter of fact some people have uh, lost scholarships because they don't, they do not have a good recommendation from their referees. Okay, so it's important that you have great relationship with someone that can vouch for you, someone that can recommend you. If you're in the university now. You should, uh, that person can be your a lecturer that you rapport with uh, or your, and, and your, like your final year project supervisor, okay? Some of people that are of great repute that uh, if they write a letter, the letter would carry weight, <laughs> as we normally say back at home. And, um, it's very important to note that, so some of your uh, referees might not know how to write a recommendation letter. However, there are samples of recommendation letters online. So you can always get a sample of your recommendation letter and then have them look at it. 
don't try to recommendation later by yourself okay and pass it off as anyway the thing is so most of the universities like especially the universities in the united states and in canada and some other countries they actually get to uh, have the referee send it directly to them so um, there'll be no hanky panky because a lot of people tend to you know do lots of hanky panky yeah. and write their own recommendation letters but then if you perceive that your referee might not know how to craft a good recommendation you could send them samples and you know like guide them of course uh, they would not lie okay <laughs> and uh, yeah statement of purpose that's also common for undergraduates and uh, <clears throat> postgraduate scholarships a statement of purpose I'm not going to talk about how to write a statement of purpose because that would be like a, an entirely different uh, whole workshop. It, it has like um, a whole different dynamics to it. But then the statement of purpose is important. And there are also resources that you can find online. In fact, some universities have samples, some departments have samples on a statement of purpose and academic uh, CV, okay? So you can use that as a guide. Of course, you're not going to copy because I tell you, if you copy your statement of purpose, you are not getting that scholarship. You're, you're going to be blacklisted from the university, possibly from the country because, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a criminal offense. Yes, it's a criminal offense. Uh, yes, yes. So um, don't attempt, attempt copying. You could use it as a guide, of course, but not um, not copying. Yeah. Uh, for the English proficiency test, that uh, is country specific, university specific. Canada at present, uh, Nigeria is not required to submit IELTS. So, yeah, you don't uh, have to. If you are applying to study, you, you'll be exempted. In the US also, um, most of the universities or some of the universities actually would uh, waive off English proficiency tests from Nigerians. Now, if there's any country or any university that made it compulsory for you to submit an IELTS or TOEFL result, you can just send an email to the uh, graduate coordinator. Every department, every graduate school has a graduate coordinator. You would, you know, tell in that email, you tell them that you're a Nigerian. For someone applying for master's or PhD, you tell them that you've studied in English and you've been speaking English since God knows when and, you know, all that stuff. And even for undergraduates also, you could, some people actually accept uh, your YAC English result. Of course, if you get a good grade in YAC English, you're fine, right? And then also your secondary school, you're not in English. You can get uh, an attestation later from your secondary school for those applying for um, undergraduate scholarship. Um, yeah, research statement, of course, that's for those that are applying for masters by research and PhD, because there are two types of masters, right? There's a uh, master's uh, by co-op, which is only one year in almost all the countries. And there's master's by coursework and research. So coursework takes about two semesters, is about a year and then research um, is 
um, done in the second year. Ella, please, can you, can you repeat that? Can you, can you repeat that part of the types of master scholarship, a master's degree? Yeah, yeah. So, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. So there are two kinds of masters that you can do. There's the masters by coursework, which is normally one year, in almost all the countries, it's usually one year. And then there's masters by research. Okay, it's like coursework and research. So the coursework is done within two semesters normally. That's one year. And then the research is carried out in the second year. So that's two years. Now, generally, when you got scholarships, the two-year master's that research has more funding. In fact, master's do not have funding generally. Of course, I know there are exceptions, but then generally, if you want to take the US or um, Canada as an example, you get more funding for masters by research, the two-year masters, than for the one-year master. master. One year masters, you you'd have to pay yourself, right? And then uh, PhD, of course, PhD in a lot of countries is free of charge. In a lot of European countries in this Scandinavians, you know, PhD is free. And in uh, places like the US, uh, Canada, of course, many countries in Europe. So PhD is normally free. In fact, in America, you get more funding for PhD than you get for the two-year masters. Wow. Yes, yes. Because it's a better investment. It's long-term. PhD is long-term. And then... With your BSc, you can get a scholarship for PhD directly without having to do um, a master's. Now, I know that uh, someone may ask how that is possible, but it's possible. A lot of people are doing it until tomorrow. People will keep doing it. So you can actually apply for a PhD as long as you have at least a fairly good research background. And yes, uh, you, you definitely would have because in your final year at the university, you would have carried out uh, your research. Okay. So there are, of course, other requirements for that. But yeah, that's possible. So, um, okay, the last thing here on requirements, academic CV, it's not the same as the normal CV you used to get the job. It's entirely different. I could send a sample of an academic CV to anyone who's interested. So if you want to apply for um, scholarship, this CV you use is completely different from the one you use in applying for a job. Okay, so there are there are different ways through which you can um, get a scholarship. Getting through a research advisor. It's one of the classic ways, actually, it's the best way. It's the best way, and it's, uh, it's simple, and it's also not simple at the same time. Yeah, it could get dicey. But if you, if you love your phone as much as I love mine, I'm normally always on the phone, and uh, so if you are hung up on your 
phone like I am, then you know you can easily just have to let's take for instance you want a scholarship to the United States of America, you just have to carefully start uh, checking out the websites of the universities that uh, offer the course you want to study. Let's take, for instance, you want to, you know, study a master in chemistry or something chemistry related, master or PhD in that. Now, I should tell you that in America, chemistry is heavily funded. My goodness, anyone who studies chemistry or something related to chemistry should not have a problem getting a scholarship in America because it wow. is heavily funded, yes, heavily funded on all fronts, heavily funded. There are lots of uh, funding for masters, for PhD, for those in that, um, in that field. So you just pick up your phone, you check out uh, the universities that have the course you want to study. You make a short list, all right? Then individually, you start uh, studying their websites. You know, you check their graduate school webpage. You, of course, you familiarize yourself with the course and the requirements. Okay. You then um, check the faculty. By faculty, I mean the lecturers, the lecturers in the particular department. And after doing that, there's only a long list of the lecturers. Uh, then you check out the one. Normally, their, uh, their research area is usually written on the website. But then if it is not, you would have to find out. It's easy to find out. You can just run their name on Google Scholar Research Gate or just on, on Google, something will come up. So you find out which of those professors are doing a research in your field. Because the, the, the example I used, chemistry, chemistry is very broad, right? So there are different research areas in chemistry. So you'd have to um, find out who is doing the research in the particular area you are interested in, the particular area you want to do a master's or PhD in, okay? So when you have figured that out, you also make another short list and then you send them cold email. Ah, before you send them cold email, you actually have to at least read uh, a few of their publications, uh, a few of their research articles, so you familiarize yourself with what they are doing, what is what is it that they do. You know, if you want to meet someone new, you definitely you have to at least find out a thing or two about the person, find out what interests that person. So when you meet them, you will be short, uh, short of words, right? So, um, yes, so you do that, you do that, and then you send them a cold email. Now, a cold email is, uh, it's simple, it really should be simple. You just it should have probably about three, three paragraphs maximum. You introduce yourself, you are, what is it that you do, uh, your research area, your research interest, and the second paragraph you actually um, kind of state how you kind of link both yours and theirs. If you could focus, uh, could focus more on theirs and when you come in, then you inquire have a place for you and that's of course after expressing your desire to work with them so it uh, yeah 
I could also um, send across a call, the classic call email, email sample that has gotten a lot of people scholarship. So yeah, so that's like the short, short summary version of getting uh, a scholarship through a supervisor. Now, for for many universities, this is compulsory. For many universities in the United States, in Canada, this is compulsory. In fact, for you to be considered for admission, you must have a supervisor first. It's normally the number one thing. Now, if you've you know done the background on the ground work of getting in touch with a supervisor, of course, not everyone would reply your email. Now we're talking about uh, a scenario where, where you've sent out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 cold emails to 50 different uh, pro professors or more, or more or less, depends. Not everyone is going to reply you. And some people will reply you and give you a negative response. But then you just need just one positive response. Okay, and then after probably schedule a meeting or something with them. Be sure to ask them if they have funding available because it's not just if they're able to, to supervise you, but then if they have funding. If they have funding, then you are good to go. Yeah, you're good to go. Now, if you've gotten a positive response from your supervisor, then, I mean, your good is gold already because then you just have to go on with the formality of applying, you know, the proper way to the university. You know, the pay the application fee, except you get the waiver, and uh, most of the universities, they have their portal online where you would just go the whole application process by yourself online, and you do that. And then, uh, yeah, for transcripts, for the meantime, you actually, during the application process, you get to upload your student's copy of the transcript. But then if your offer is confirmed, you would have to send over, you would have to have your school send over an official transcript. I understand that uh, some of our universities in Nigeria are actually been very difficult with the transfer issue. And I really look forward to that um, being resolved soon, somehow. Yeah. So uh, I think that's, that's a short version of that. For this, the key point you have to take away is for different countries, different universities, just search the universities that have your course. You, search the professors under your course, you read up on their recent research and then you send them cold email. If everything goes well with that, if they've agreed to supervise you and yes, they have funding to fund your, um, your study, then you go on to apply. Definitely after a few months, your application will be confirmed and you are good to go. Okay, so another way you can get, now for the first one I talked about, you don't actually get to see it publicly. I mean, you you don't get to see advertisements that uh, I'm looking for graduate students. But then here, you get to actually see the adverts on LinkedIn, especially LinkedIn and Twitter, and their websites, and sometimes Facebook too. And that um, brings me to the importance of 
beneficial quality connections on social media. Yeah. Uh, some of us we, we use the social media, but then we don't exactly have quality connections. Some of us don't even use LinkedIn. I mean, if you're here tonight and you don't have a LinkedIn account, I would actually say right after this program should go and sign up on LinkedIn. And uh, if you are uh, graduate or an undergraduate, sign up on LinkedIn, search for people in your field in any university, and just um, connect with them on LinkedIn, follow them on Twitter. It's all these PIs, the primary investigators, as to say the lecturers or the professors mainly, or even departments, they're the ones that they put up the flyer whenever they're looking for graduate students. We see a lot of them every day on LinkedIn, on Twitter. And sometimes if you also, you, you actually also see um, some of the advertised positions on their personal website or department website, right? So, yeah, make quality connections on the internet, right? So you can actually see the adverts and you see the requirement and then you send an email and proceed with an application, you are accepted. So that's, that's for the ones that are publicly advertised. Okay, so, so far I have talked about um, positions that are advertised by the, by the professors and the ones not advertised by the professors, but then you pursue it by yourself. Now, there are also lots of um, scholarship from government, from uh, NGOs, from multinationals, from the universities. Now, these ones are public. Okay, like the Japanese MEX, the uh, Korean government scholarship, the Chinese scholarships, the Swedish from the Swedish government, okay, or like um, the government, uh, the scholarship from different universities. Some universities, you don't actually have to get a supervisor for some of the universities. If you apply and get admitted, definitely you're getting funding full funding. So if you're not going to get fund, you're not going to get admitted. So for those, you just have, have to search for this type of scholarships. And then you get your documents together. And buy. Now, same goes for, you know, we have the PTDF scholarship, which is a very lucrative scholarship that Nigerians are taking advantage of. And there's also the Commonwealth Scholarship. There's the Erasmus Mondus that is very, I mean, it's a gold mine, really. Okay. So yes, this is true. There are lots of, there are lots of people that apply for scholarships. Yet, there are limited number of scholarships, limited number of, limited amount of funding. You know, no matter uh, what I sugarcoat tonight, one truth is that, um, sadly, not everybody is going to get scholarship because it's limited, it's quite limited. You know, you, you have uh, 100,000 people applying for a scholarship that would accept, say, only 100 people in a year. 
So it's a competition, right? And there'll be people that would uh, not get in. But then what can you do to increase your chances? Especially for the university-based scholarship, the um, one by country-specific government scholarships, the even the ones by NGOs, multinationals, and all what not, by international organizations, you know, those kind of scholarship. There are a lot of competition, right? Now, um, earlier we talked about uh, GRE, if GRE is, uh, Compulsory. Now, GRE is the Graduate Record Examination. It's an examination that uh, is sometimes required for Masters or PhD admission. Now, some if you go to some university website, you'll see something like GRE Gray. Gray, not compulsory, but recommended. It's not compulsory. I mean, without Gray, you can get admission, you can get the scholarship. But then Gray would actually boost the chances, you know, keep you on the good side. Okay. And some, some uh, universities or some departments actually did do not require it at all. But then possibly if you you know if you write it, it will also boost your chances. Now there are some people that uh, they don't have very good results. Let's say you finished with really two that's like second class law or even a third class. You can get a scholarship, yes. The scholarship is not just for those who finish with the first class. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's it's important I put that out. The scholarship, fully funded scholarship abroad, is not only for those that finished with a first class or a second class offer. With your second class lower. With your third class, you can get a scholarship abroad. But then you have to work twice as hard. You have to work twice as hard. Sometimes even twice as hard, you know. It's tough out there. It's a competition and you're competing against those that got the first class. So you have to work hard. Um, now, let's take, for instance, you're applying for a master's, you finish the 2-2 two -two or your third class. Now, even if GRE is not compulsory, you might have to write it to boost your chances. You should actually write it to boost your chances. Okay, you write the grey exam, you have, have to study properly and write it so you get uh, good, so you, you pass very well, you know, get a good grade for GRE. Um, now, if you don't have, uh, say, maybe any, if you've not reached the research paper or, any, or presented at any conference, you might make efforts to do that. You, know, you might want to make efforts to do that. If you don't have uh, experience, I say since you graduated, if not had experience in the industry you graduated from, you might have to make efforts to at least get some experience, even if it means uh, unpaid internships. It goes into your academic CV, it's a plus. You know, just anything to boost your CV, anything to market yourself, really. 
okay? Because uh, it's a competition. You are competing with those that, you know, have better grades, yeah. So you actually want to go the extra mile, right? You want to go the extra mile. You craft your statement of purpose in such a way that it stands out. It represents who you are, where you're coming from, where you are, where you intend to go, what you intend to do, right? You you make it state of the art, okay? And um, of course, there, there, there may be other minor requirements that are not compulsory. But then if you're already disadvantaged, you'd actually want to do those just to add to just to boost yourself, you know, to be at an advantage. Right? Um yeah, just uh, some of those things. There are other there are some other things that you depending on the scholarship and specific requirement. Right, so a lot of people have uh, fell for scholarship scams, unfortunately. Okay, so you wouldn't want to fall for scholarship scams. If you see a link, a scholarship from a link that you're not sure of, the best thing to do is to, if you mention the university, if you mention an organization, you check out the official site. That is uh, normally gold. Just check out official site of the university or official site of the organization. Yeah, that's the simple way to do it. Okay, so these are some of the few popular scholarships. I did apply for the Japanese next in 2014. Yeah. I applied for that, I didn't get it. If I had applied again, I would have gotten it. Who knows? <laughs> and yeah, there are lots of <laughs> lots of uh, other scholarships. This is just like a drop of water in the ocean of scholarships. There are many more, many more. So uh, of course, you might apply, apply again, apply again for many years even, and then not get it. But then the only thing you're looking for is one yes to count a thousand no's. So I would advise you not to give up, really. The tenacity you know, you have to be tenacious and not give up and try to learn from your mistakes. Yeah, learn from your mistakes. Uh, have good interpersonal skills, good communication. Learn to learn your grammar correctly. I mean, that's funny, but then I feel I should say it. Some of our young people, they can't craft a very good official email. It's funny when I say it, it's even funny to me, but then it's the reality. You should be able to uh, send an official email with without grammatical blunders or shorthand to those in authority. Take for instance, you applied for a scholarship or you applied for an admission expecting funding, you haven't heard from them. You could send an email to the graduate coordinator. Or possibly you heard from them and then you didn't get it. You got a love letter, which is 
aka rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> a love letter it's a rejection letter if you got that you know you could you could ask questions you could ask questions and ask why and when you ask why when you get the feedback you actually use that to learn maybe it's something you know if it's something from your end and not from their end and improve right and uh, when it comes to scholarships although um alabelia said that we applied for sri lanka and then again applied to sri lanka for the second time fixating on just one country oh well, generally when it comes to scholarship i do not believe in fixating on just one country surprise but yes i i don't so i would actually advise you that uh, um don't just put your mind maybe you love canada oh i love canada too by the way i personally would uh i would soon start applying to graduate school right and oh i love canada oh i love the us i'm not going to be fixating on those two on either of them there are lots of opportunities in other countries so you have the us you have canada you have germany you have australia my goodness australia has lots of offers and you know what there's no application fee for australia in the us you you know you spend from fifty dollars seventy dollars seventy five dollars hundred dollars for application fee in canada um it's uh hundred dollars hundred and twenty five canadian dollars of course for application fee in australia you don't get to pay application fee right so you don't have to worry about uh, paying application fee for australia and if, if you're doing research masters masters by research honestly you should think about australia some people give lame excuses like oh australia is too far or there are lots of wild animals and snakes in australia <laughs> <laughs> Well, come on, that's that's nonsense, really. Australia is a wonderful place, and um, it has a lot of opportunities. Okay, and so do the countries. It's not just America, not just Canada, not just even Australia, not just New Zealand, not just Germany not just the uk not just uh, any of these uh, european countries south korea is also a good place japan is a wonderful place china is an awesome place singapore is beautiful like there are lots of um, developed countries that uh, you can actually look towards to and have lots of opportunities. Now, I should add that apart from um, the fully funded, uh, fully funded opportunities, there are also certain um, low tuition options, especially in Europe. Okay, you have lots of countries that of low tuition and if you actually calculate how much that is and some are tuition free you just have to cast your net in and never know what you're gonna catch and um if you if you don't want to be in nigeria at this time next year now if you, if you have a target that oh by september 2023 
I want to be abroad studying, you really should um, now start getting your documents together. Start visiting websites of um, funding organizations of universities and all whatnot. And stand, uh, start uh, sending cold emails. Okay. So just to wrap up, up undergraduate, straightforward. You get all the documents that I mentioned. You um, search for country specific or university specific scholarships, and then you apply directly because you'd have to follow the guidelines. Some of them have uh, specific guidelines and you have you may have to do some Abuja runs by going to Abuja from wherever you are, maybe to certify one document or the other or to get an accommodation or the other. And then you just apply. And if it's a graduate scholarship, you can go through a supervisor. If you get a supervisor, then all is perfectly well. Or you check for advertising position and you do the same thing. Or um, you also check for university-based scholarships or the ones offered by the government or on third parts, third party organizations. So yeah, really the world is uh, your oyster. You can do, you can read, you, you can um, do anything if you believe and if you're committed 